So the texts end with the phrases, as we are one, in the same way that we are one, as we are one. This is what Jesus wants for those people who he has gathered to himself over the years that he's been walking about, teaching, healing, relieving, in a basic way, being a good friend and a good neighbor to any person that he meets along his way. And at this point in his career, he is preparing to make his departure. He sort of has a sense of where he is going because his message has been resisted by the powers of the world. But Jesus, in the three years that he has spent with these folks, has cultivated a community. And he has prepared that community for a work. And the very fact that we have these texts before us and that we take them seriously is a sign that what Jesus set out to do, he did accomplish. The chosen ones did take the message out into the world and they took it out authoritatively. That is to say, they took it out in a convincing manner and I would propose to you, it is because that they were united in that purpose. I will suggest, as we were speaking with the children, there was a team spirit at work. Now that basically draws in the John text, and I'd also make a small reference to the Peter text, and this whole notion of humbling yourselves before God. There are times when we're not sure what to do next, and we look to all of our available resources, and we recognize that they may not be adequate to the challenge that we face. And in such a moment, we might be inclined to despair. And I think the text from Peter encourages us not to despair, but rather to say, I'm at my wit's end. Help. And to simply speak that sentence, acknowledging dependency, so that pride is overcome. And I suspect that that is very, very key, that we be humbled persons, and life will do that to us. But the key thing I want to pick up out of the Peter text is the little bit about your adversary, the devil, is walking about, seeking whom he may devour. Now the devil has got a picture in our minds over the years of this satanic, malevolent, evil creature that goes about causing trouble. But that's a mistake. That's a nice theme in poets like William Blake and many others. But the scriptures do not speak about that kind of a devil. The scriptures speak about a principle. So as Jesus reveals for us the principle of unity with God, the devil reveals the principle of being divided from God. Devil is an English word from a Greek word, and the Greek word means to throw apart. So when Peter encourages us to beware of the devil, he's encouraging us to be aware of that which throws us apart, that which causes division. So what we have is the opportunity to be united. And in that unity, we have authority. This is what we see in the Gospels and in the book of Acts. When the community is gathered in Jesus' name, and I wish that you would be clear that in Jesus' name is not some kind of a magical formula. It speaks more to the fact in the character of Jesus. So Jesus as the one who is humble. Jesus as the one who is doing what God wants done. Jesus as the one who is not only related to God, but out of that relationship with God, related to the neighbor. And that's where we are to be encouraged, to resist anything that wants to bring divisions into our hope for unity and our hope for effective ministry. Now I wanted to say a little bit about my name, George, because in the Bible everything has significance and names have significance. And those of you who are thoughtful, who are reflective, may have taken time to think about your name. What does it mean? And most of us have seen baby books where names are explained there, like Barbara's name means coming with joy, or foreigner coming with joy. So when I met her, there was this strange person, this foreigner, who came into my life with joy and changed me. But my name is George, and George is from the Greek as well, and basically it means plowman or tiller of the soil. And I'd like to tell you a little story about how my name became meaningful to me. And this is a story about my relationship with my father. 
And I use that word deliberately because Jesus always spoke of his relationship with his Father and how he only did what the Father wanted him to do. Well, I don't want to claim that I always did what Father wanted me to do. There were many times when I did what he did not want me to do. But later in life, I began to see that he had some sense. And <laughs> thank you for catching that. <laughs> you see, Dad and I, you all have dads, right? You all have relationships with your dads. But Dad had a piece of property about a quarter of a section or so, I'm not sure of the measurements. He had a piece of property in which he grew canola. But there was also 40 acres of fallow ground, and that fallow ground was my favorite place. It's what we would call a meadow. In other words, it had not been cultivated for many, many years and nature had taken over. And for me as a poetic young man, it was a beautiful place to be. In the migratory season, the sandhill cranes would come over, the geese and the ducks, because there's a big reserve just south of uh, the border in Manitoba there. And I loved the place. And one day dad told me that he wanted me to plow that 40 acres up because he was going to put buckwheat in. And we were poor farmers, so we had always second-hand equipment, equipment that you had to keep repairing. And we didn't have a plow, we had what's called a, uh, a deep dish cultivator, I think it is, round wheels. And it will do the job of a plow, but not nearly as efficiently as a plow. And we had an old McCormick tractor. And I remember that tractor because on its engine there was a little thing that said, service this machine religiously. <laughs> And, and I took a lesson from that. If you want your tractor to last, and this was an old McCormick. If you want your tractor to last a lifetime, take care of its needs. Change the oil regularly. Lubricate the joints and all those kinds of things. So my job was to get on this old McCormick tractor, hitch it up to the deep dish cultivator, and to till up or to plow up this fallow ground. And I was angry when I started. I was resentful when I started. And I'd get on that machine and it'd get plugged up and I would have to unplug it and I would be muttering and sputtering about the stupidity of the old man who didn't have the sense to know that this was beautiful just the way it was. And what was he thinking? Turning everything into money. Anyway, I want to keep it fairly short. I'll let you know that I got the 40 acres plant plowed up, turned up, dad, uh, you harrow it and you make it nice and ready. And then he put the seed in, buckwheat seed. And the point that I would like to bring to your attention is that in the fall, I stood in that field. And it was a beautiful, clear, prairie, moonlit night, a full moon. And the field was filled with buckwheat. It was a bumper crop. And if you know buckwheat, you know that it's bright white, the flowers. And in the full moon, that field, and the text came to my mind, the fields are white for the harvest. And I realized that I had been called to do something that I did not want to do, that I was uncomfortable doing, but that my father had been right, that his purpose was clear, and it ended up being very useful to us when the harvest came in so that we could manage our family economy in a good way. And I want to tell you that story because there is some sense in which the modern world has gone fallow you will be aware that the name of God is no longer has the respect that it had, say, when Ed and Alice were young people. They grew up in a world, and many of you along with them, in which God was respected. And God was a common center for a people who faced a hard life. It was a hard life settling this land in the earliest days. And so the people had to call out for help again and again, and they found over time that God was sufficient to their need. And the dilemma there is that they prospered. And in their prosperity, their children began to get the idea that life was easier than it actually was. And their grandchildren got to the point where they actually thought, this is the way it is. Life is good. So what I would like to suggest is that with the absence of God, we have also uncovered a whole systemic net of problems. All of the things that used to hold us together are now dividing us. So what has happened is we've come to a place in our social economy where every person has to do the right to do whatever they please. It's their money, it's their life, it's their freedom, they can do as they wish. And that has some problems for folks who want to follow in the way of the gospel. Because in the way of the gospel, one of the things that you do is you relinquish your autonomy. 
And that's what we remember when we baptize babies and when we are baptized as adults. By that ritual act, we signify that we want to participate in something larger than ourselves. Something meaningful, something purposeful. And I would like to make it clear to you that this is not something religious in the first place. The God I am speaking about is not a God who wants ceremonies, who wants elaborate things done to please him or her, as some people now say. God, like Jesus, is neither male nor female. I hope you understand that. If you want a picture of God, go out and try to look at the wind. You can see what it's doing, but you can't see it itself. That's the picture of God I'd like to leave in your mind. But we have opportunity now, all of us, to bring forward the best that is in us and to add that to the mix so that all together our goodness will add up to make a difference in the lives of those we care about. Those we care about immediately in our families, those we care about sort of uh, contextually, our neighbors, our fellow citizens in the city, and all that we care about, and we would go so far as to say even that our small difference here would make a difference in the life of this planet, which is it's hard to say. It's easy to say that some of our elders, some of the folks who we've known, have gotten old and they're now on their deathbeds. But folks, we're at a point where we may be ready to declare the planet to be palliative. That all we can do now is keep things comfortable and encouraged as we go into a very uncertain future. So what I'm inviting you to do is to think about your priorities in your life. What matters most to you? And I hope that you will not get stuck, divided about things that don't matter at all. And I have seen so many congregations divided over the color of a carpet, the shape of a symbol, the place of a piece of furniture, Wars in churches get started over these things. And that ought not to be. We ought to be in agreement that we respect and care for one another. And that's our primary purpose. So that even when there is difference, that difference can be negotiated in a framework of respect and honor. So I am encouraging you to find out for yourself what it means to be one with Jesus. One with God, one with the Holy Spirit, and through that understanding, how you can apply yourself to being one people, one faith, one baptism, one Lord, one purpose. And the purpose is very, very simple. To seek justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly. And I'm going to ask you to sing that song as a response. Number 701.